This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 264 was recorded on March 25th, 2021. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Abra Silver Resource Corporation, a premier emerging silver and gold exploration company, ticker ABRA on TSX Venture and ABBRF in the United States. Billionaire Canadian financier Robert Friedland will join me as this week's feature interview guest. Now, as we explained last week, Robert already gave me a terrific two-part interview on the Smarter Markets podcast on the subject of what it's really going to take to green the global economy. In today's Macro Voices interview, we'll discuss how to invest in the formative green revolution and where the best opportunities can be found for investors. So if you missed the two-part interview on Smarter Markets, we suggest you listen to that first. You'll find the link in your research roundup email or at smartermarketspod.com. Then be sure to stay tuned for our post-game segment when Patrick's chart deck will be titled Flirting with the 50-Day Moving Averages. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Eric, let's jump into that S&P 500 because uh, we're now going about five, six days of selling off of the uh, highs that were put in. And uh, it's been weakening a little bit. What's your take? Do you think uh, this is just going to be a buy on dip opportunity? You know, I don't know, Patrick. Uh, it's been a whole week since there was an all-time high, and people are starting to get upset about that. Uh, boy, if, if ever there was a sign of a top, it's when people think it's a big deal that there hasn't been a new all-time high in the last week. On the other hand, boy, the, the evidence for a crack-up boom and central bank-driven liquidity just carrying these markets higher is pretty darn strong. So no real change in my outlook. I think this could go either way. I don't think this is an easy market to call by any stretch of the imagination. Imagination. But I do think if I was going to make any play on it, it would be something like your rolling straddle or calendared straddle strategy, where you're betting that there needs to be a big move in one direction or the other without taking a directional assumption as to which way it's going to go. Uh, I don't think it's safe to make big directional calls in this market. Okay, let's move on to that U.S. dollar index because uh, we are now decisively above 92. We uh, almost got up to the 93 level today. Is this a breakout in your mind? Well, Patrick, I definitely think we should put a chart of this up in the postgame segment because, yes, we did finally get our daily close over 92 only a couple of days ago because as much as you'd had a few tests above it, it was only intraday. So it's only a couple of days, but boy, in those couple of days since we did get that closing print above 92, it's continued to move up from there almost to 93 as we're speaking. You know, looks to me like there's some legs to this and that we're going to see at least some further upside. The thing, as I've said before, Patrick, is I just don't care about the dollar index as much as I used to because it's a relative measure. It's the dollar versus other currencies. The value of all fiat currencies is going down, not up. What we're seeing here in the dollar index is that the U.S. dollar is stronger than other fiats, not that the dollar is gaining purchasing power relative to real things in the real world. So I'm not as focused on it as I used to be, but it does look like the trend is actually starting to turn up and we're beyond that consolidation range that we've been stuck in for the last several months. Eric, let's get to that crude oil because the correction seems to be continuing. I'd love to get your take on what's uh, going on here. Well, needless to say, as we told you last Thursday, that big, huge move down definitely changed the game. So we've now got on the daily chart a downtrend, not an uptrend. And, you know, this is totally to be expected. How many times have I said in the course of this meteoric rise where crude oil has effectively doubled in price since November, that at some point we had to see a significant pullback? So far, we got about $10 of downtrend. 
downside. Maybe that could be the end of it. I think it probably has farther to go. I'll be very surprised if we move below 50 and stay there. I, I could imagine, maybe worst case, that there is a, a brief challenge on an intraday basis below 50 just to knock out any stop orders that might be sitting just below that round number support. But frankly, even getting down to 50, I doubt it. I, I think we'll stay probably in the 55 to 60 range as far as where we might get at a bottom. Now, there is an argument that says maybe the bottom is already in, and that argument is so far the bottom has been almost perfectly on the 13-week moving average at 57 spot 38. We already know that the daily chart pattern has shifted from uptrend to downtrend. But on the weekly chart, which is much longer uh, in terms of its time scale, we're still in an uptrend. Now, a, a weekly close below the 13-week moving average, so that would be a close on Friday below 57 spot 38, that would change the direction of the weekly trend to down as opposed to up. Now, is that really going to make any difference? Is anybody paying attention to that? I don't know. But certainly when we do get that signal, if we get it, of a weekly close below 57 spot 39, that would really say, okay, there's probably more to this. There's more coming. Maybe it'll take another month to play out as corrections and consolidations tend to. If we stay above 57.39, that suggests maybe this is just a short-lived spike down and might be over soon. Any hope of it being over soon would be abandoned, though, on a weekly close below 57.39. So I'm watching that level pretty quickly. But Patrick, this doesn't change the big picture. We're in a secular bull market in terms of commodities generally and particularly in terms of crude oil. Anytime the price of anything doubles in the course of a few months, the fact that you get a significant pullback shouldn't surprise anybody. As far as inventory this week, crude oil built 1.9 million barrels, a bigger build than expected. But there was also a gasoline build of fairly small, 203,000 barrels, but a pretty significant distillate build of 3.8 million barrels. So builds across the board. On a net basis, it's a build of 5 million barrels of petroleum products between crude and finished products. That should have been a bearish signal. And of course, the market crashed on that news. Down, down, down in a, in a sell-off that lasted for, wait for it, 9.6 minutes before it had fully retraced back to pre-inventory levels, and it just took off to the upside from there. When I saw that, the market shrugging off what could have been a bearish inventory report and moving fairly aggressively higher and also taking out the five-day moving average in the process, I really thought for a while on Thursday, okay, maybe this is already over. But the retest today of that 13-week moving average at 57.40 really says to me, Meh, okay, there's probably more downside to come before it's over. I don't think it's a whole lot more downside. U.S. production, 11 million barrels, ticking up by just 100,000 barrels from where it was and back to exactly where it was before the Texas freeze out. So we've recovered U.S. production back to where it was. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens, Patrick. I don't think that we have a crash or the end of the world. Some people are saying, oh no, look at what happened to the May contract last year. Look, we had a complete totally different fundamental backdrop last year. This is not the beginning of a crash that's going to take us to negative prices just the way the same thing happened last year. This is the beginning of an overdue correction, which may take us another 5 or $6 lower before it's over. Yeah, who knows? Maybe it's a whole $10 lower, but it's a perfectly healthy correction in a bull market. Eric, let's move on to gold. We're now several weeks off of that low, and but gold really seems to be struggling here. What's your take on the price action? Well, it's really not impressing me that much in terms of a lot of people were saying, okay, it's you know, that's got to be it. It's over. We're, it's all headed up from here. First of all, you would need a daily close above 1780, which is where the channel resistance line is now, in order to even have a signal that there had been a change in direction. And frankly, off of that low that we had at 1680, we only got about halfway there, and already the market appears to be rolling over. Furthermore, it doesn't seem to have been able to get beyond its short-term moving averages, the 5, 8, and 13-day moving average, and that's often a sign that, you know, maybe we're, we're getting to the point 
point where this bounce has topped out and we're about to head down. We haven't taken out all of those short-term moving averages to the downside yet, but we're right on the hairy edge of that. So just a little bit more downside on a closing basis, and it would really suggest that we're maybe headed down to another lower low or to retest that low. And again, I don't think any of this should really come as any great surprise to anyone. We're seeing a perception that real rates are backing up and that there's a trend of increasing real interest rates. I think that's just because inflation is lagging in its reporting. But at the same time, that's what people think, and that's what they're trading on. It's perfectly reasonable to expect further downside, and if it happens, I think it's a gift to gold bulls who will seize that opportunity to buy even more gold at even better prices. And I won't be at all surprised if there's another 200 bucks of downside from here. Long run, it's going to be all up for gold, but it's a story that's not ready to play out yet. Eric, let's wrap up by touching on this 10-year treasury yield. Uh, we, we printed about 175 a week ago, and uh, we're really off about 10, 15 basis points off the high. Nothing crazy. What's your take? Do you think uh, that's like a meaningful turn in their yields, or is it uh, just a, a typical little pause? Patrick, I think the real question is not where the number is right now, but where the trend is headed. We have had a couple of false signals where somebody famous like David Tepper says, okay, folks, that's it. We've reached as far as we're going to see on the backup. And everybody's like, okay, somebody famous said, uh, said this is over. Let's breathe a sigh of relief and uh, forget it ever happened. Then we go to higher yields and everybody panics again and the world is coming to an end and the sky is falling and so on and so forth. And then we start to see a little backing off in those yields. The question is, are we in the middle of a trend which is going to continue to higher yields or have we seen a peak? I don't know the answer to that question, Patrick. I'm going to continue to ask our macro interview guests and try to get their perspective in coming weeks. Well, this week's feature interview guest is billionaire Canadian financier Robert Friedland. Now, Eric, why did we invite Robert on the show this week? This is an important one, Patrick. There have been moments in Macro Voices history where we supplied you with serious edge. The last and most notable one would be January 30th, 2020, when we dropped everything and changed our production schedule to bring you Dr. Chris Martinson to explain that a global pandemic was very possibly coming that eventually led to, to me discussing selling crude oil futures and buying puts on crude oil futures and so forth, which turned out to be an incredibly lucrative trade. I'm going to make the argument that Robert Friedland's revelation, which was already expressed in the two-part series that many of our listeners already heard in the Smarter Markets podcast, that all you have to do is figure out how to drill the right-sized and shaped tunnels through very hot rock, and you can completely solve the clean energy decarbonization problem for the whole planet. That is really profound. Now, Robert Friedland doesn't have the solution. He does have a billion dollars of investment of his own and his friend's money into a, uh, a unicorn company that's trying to find that solution. But regardless of whether Robert's company or somebody else figures this out, Getting a real solution to climate change and eliminating dependency on fossil fuels is a game changer for the whole planet. And I think it's really important to understand where this geothermal opportunity lies, what the technology barriers are that are preventing us from solving this problem right now, and what it's going to take to overcome them. Let's uh, come back. I, wanna, I don't want to steal Robert Friedland's thunder, so let's let him talk about this in the future interview and touch on it again, Patrick, when we get to the postgame segment. All right. Well, Eric's interview with Robert is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies, which also sponsors my new Smarter Markets podcast, which airs every Saturday morning and explores how the markets themselves could be redesigned to better serve market participants and society as a whole. My two-part interview with billionaire financier Robert Friedland exploring what it will take to green the global economy is already available now at SmarterMarketsPod.com and is strongly recommended as prerequisite listening before today's feature interview. My guest on Smarter Markets this coming Saturday morning will be Dr. Lehman Baird. 
co-founder of Hedera Hashgraph and the inventor of Hashgraph, one of the first distributed ledger technologies to be based on proof-of-stake rather than proof-of-work validation in order to provide a much faster and more efficient alternative to blockchain. But you won't find Smarter Markets on your Macro Voices feed. You have to separately subscribe to Smarter Markets in your podcast app to receive this free new podcast. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is billionaire financier Robert Friedland, best known as the founder and CEO of Ivanhoe Mining, but perhaps more relevantly to this conversation, Robert is also the chairman and CEO of Ivanhoe Capital Corporation, the private venture capital and uh, family office enterprise, which invests in a lot of fascinating technologies that I want to talk to Robert about today in this interview. Listeners, if you didn't catch it in the introduction with Patrick Ceresna, please be sure to first listen to my two interviews with Robert on the subject of greening the global economy on the Smarter Markets podcast, because what we're going to do in today's interview is to expound on that conversation. If you didn't hear that conversation, today's conversation isn't going to make sense. Robert, let's start not with those topics, but with you as an investor, because your mind absolutely fascinates me. You wowed our Smarter Markets audience with the story of camel polo in the snow on your albino racing camel. So we kind of have this vision of Robert Friedland as the camel riding mining executive who sounds like an Indiana Jones kind of character. But you were one of the principal investors and creators of satellite radio, Sirius and XM satellite radio. So I'm just trying to imagine how does a, a mining executive sit down one day and say, hey, I, I think I'll take advantage of advancements in MOSFET transistors and, you know, invent Sirius XM radio. How do you know about all these things and, and thorium reactors and all the other things that we're going to talk about today? Well, you know, um, I grew up in the 1960s. Uh, when the the motto was turn on, tune in, drop out, and then my dad crawl back. So having li lived in the 1960s and the psychedelic era, I think from a very early age, a lot of my friends and I sort of thought that it's possible to create a reality distortion field. And so unconventional thinking has been a part of my life for as long back as I can remember. And I've always liked to hang around with people who think that nothing is impossible. And so, you know, we always look at everything from first principles, perhaps with a different sort of viewpoint than most people. But I've seen miracles created in my lifetime. I've seen many things become huge out of nothing. And so that's always changed my view uh, and made me feel that truly anything is impossible and that we're really limited only by the human imagination and focusing our attention continuously until we achieve what it is we imagined. Well, let's dive into some of these topics that we discussed in the Smarter Markets series uh, on greening the global economy. Starting with the green revolution and decarbonization is obviously a big political theme. Jeff Curry from Goldman Sachs told us the biggest priority of financial markets has to be putting a price on carbon. How should we as investors think about decarbonization specifically? Where are the investment plays? We'll get later into some of the energy generation stuff, but just about this idea of decarbonization and, and now the, the trading of carbon credits on markets. Uh, how do you think about that as an investor? Well, just to start with the minor protest, we can't really eliminate one of the most common elements in the universe, carbon. We're a carbon-based life form as is our, as our pet dogs and cats. So it's really carbon dioxide we're speaking about, a global warming gas, which is not as potent a global warming gas as methane, for example. So there are a whole family of gases in the environment that really apparently, to the best of modern science, are leading to a greenhouse effect and are going to cause enormous long-term problems for humanity unless that trend is reversed. You ask the average person what percentage of the atmosphere is carbon dioxide. I wonder if you happen to know. I ought to know that. Um, well, let's 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 take a guess. CO two, not carbon. I mean, you're not breathing. It's carbon dioxide. So, 
Let's take a look at Google. What does Google say? Well, I don't. Uh, that's cheating. I want to say less than two percent because I know you got twenty-one percent oxygen and about seventy-seven or seventy-eight uh, percent of uh, nitrogen. So that only leaves one or two percent of CO two and other gases. Exactly. You're quite warm. So uh, carbon dioxide is point oh four of one percent of the Earth's atmosphere. Point oh four of one percent. So that's not very much, at least optically or intuitively. But combined with other global warming gases, it doesn't take much to get a few degrees temperature increase. And then all that permafrost in Siberia can melt and release a lot more global warming gas into the environment. And we could get sort of a, a runaway effect that we don't really want to gamble with. So the fact that we've evolved as a species with sufficient introspection to think that it's possible that anthropomorphic global warming is even possible is not unlike the evolution of our thinking that the earth is not flat or that the, the sun does not revolve around the earth. And so these big concepts, they're very, very slow to be realized throughout the mass of total human consciousness. The whole thought of plate tectonics, the, the fact that the continents are floating on a liquid golf ball as we hurtle through space, and that all these continents are eventually going to be recycled back into the core of the Earth. New York City is going to go down back into the mantle. Los Angeles and London will eventually go back into the mantle. These startling concepts of plate tectonics that modern geology now understands, these ideas have only been with us for 30 years or so and really haven't permeated into you know, human consciousness. So this idea about global warming gas has taken about a generation. My daughter, uh, Uma, who was sort of raised in an alternative lifestyle from the time she was a kid, was always talking about global warming gas. It's now gotten to the point where it's, it's precipitating an almost species-wise study of the Earth's atmosphere and humanity's impact on nature in general, and this may mark the first time as a species we abandon fire. And there's a lot of places where you might not be allowed to have a fireplace anymore and burn wood, even though that's closer to being carbon neutral, carbon dioxide neutral to be precise. So I'm sort of amused by everybody talks about a war on carbon when in fact we're made out of carbon. And the concept about reduction of global warming gas is complex because when you're a dog, is sitting there panting. <laughs> He's exhaling carbon, carbon dioxide, and so are you every time you exhale. So it's a very complex problem, and it requires us to look at uh, you know, all living systems and all technological systems in a completely new way. So this is going to be around for a long time, and this change is going to be a lot bigger than, uh, as we said in a previous talk, when in Ronald Reagan's time, you could get the long the bond market at 21% interest rates. And going long bonds was a great idea from Ronald Reagan to, say, Joe Biden. And now the bond market is looking like, well, maybe that's not such a good idea anymore. It's going to have a similar longevity as we look at the transformation of the elimination of global warming gas and all of our systems and everything we do. Just, to, just not to take chances because of how disastrous it could potentially be if the worst case came to fruition. So this is going to be a really interesting topic a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And these, these long-term changes affect the financial markets and they affect the perception of what has value or what is currency or what is money. And of course, everything is going to change through this enormous generational long transformation. And that's where we're playing. We're playing where uh, disruptive technology is going to have a big effect on what elements in the periodic table are going to be more valuable in the future and which elements in the periodic table are going to be less valuable. And, and, and if carbon dioxide and other global warming gas are the, let's say they're the thermometer, the temperature in the thermometer, we have to look at what elements are going to be required to monkey with the temperature in that thermometer. And that has a lot to do with technology and the nexus of raw materials, which is the great space we're playing in.
Robert, in the Smarter Markets interviews, you described electrifying the global economy, not just as a good idea, but the only way forward for global society in order to get through this green challenge that we face. That's a really big deal. And as we discussed in that interview, it's going to require building a whole new electric grid. And as you described, the United States is a long ways behind China in terms of the quality of engineering and advancement of technology in the electric grid. It seems on the surface like, okay, this has got to be a fantastic investment opportunity, invest in building the grid. But but hang on a second. You and I are talking about how the U.S. electric grid has to be rebuilt. We get it. Uh, most people don't. This doesn't even seem to be a subject of public conversation. So is there an investment right now in the build out of the electric grid? Or is this just we hope the government gets their act together sometime in the foreseeable future? Well, that's an interesting and narrow little question. I'm I'm sure people that are in Texas who just lived through a failure of the grid would would tell you that there's something that's going to have to be done about that particular grid, which incidentally is not linked to the federalization or national electric grid in the United States. For, for strange and bizarre circumstances in the past, Texas's grid is not connected to the rest of the United States. Now, that may be very good for the independence of Texas when it was an independent country, but unless they find a way to winterize their grid and harden it against future shock, I think people are going to rethink that one from first principles. So, you know, there have been failures of the grid in the past. New York City was plunged into darkness in a citywide failure, say, 20, 25 years ago. The electricity in New York is largely hydroelectric power that comes down from Quebec. The Canadians are so kind as to have dammed their lakes and built dams 40, 50 years ago, and they pumped that power down electric wires to New York City. There's only one nuclear power plant near the city that is scheduled to be dismantled. So when you start talking about how we generate electricity, how we transmit electrical energy, how we bring it the final mile into your home, clearly electrification is the only way to you know keep us out of the stone ages, whether it's a school or a hospital or an educational institution whether it's for the provision of food, energy is fundamental to how we run this planet. And the carrying capacity of the planet is debatable. We have, we have roughly 7 billion people on this little ball of iron and silica hurtling through space. We may go to 8 or 9 billion people in our natural lifespan, uh, and then it may or may not taper off. A lot of the world's great religions still advocate large families, and so it seems like in a lot of developing nations, population growth is still explosive. Take Nigeria, for example, quite explosive, or Indonesia, very young demographics and a lot of growth. So the world is going to look very different in 20 years as we have a massive increase in urbanization. When I was born in the 1950s, maybe a third of the world's people lived in cities. And now in our lifetime, we're going to have about 60% of the global population moving to cities with an ever smaller percentage of people living in rural environments. And those cities, obviously, are very dependent on the rest of the planet for everything they consume. And let's hope that we electrify them so that the air pollution alone doesn't lead to a massive increase in dementia, heart disease, cancer, and other diseases. Because I'd say clean air is probably the number one human requirement. Clean water would rank a close second, and then linked to clean water is good food. And what could be more basic than food and air and water? And those three things are affected by the whole energy system. So the, the whole system has to be looked at cradle to grave, sperm to germ, or womb to tomb. The, the whole system is coming under analysis so that as a species, we can live in tune with Mother Nature. It's possible, it's doable, and it's achievable in our lifetime.
Robert, let's talk now about how to make money in terms of investing in this electrification trend. Uh, Just so that you don't get accused of talking your book, I'll be the one to make the observation that copper is a huge, huge winner here. Your own company, Ivan Homine's uh, ticker IVN, is an obvious play. Let's talk now about what's not so obvious. What are the other things that you invest in if you want to bet on the electrification of the global economy, including probably a rebuild of the U.S. electric grid at some point? Well, there are about six or eight elements in the periodic table that are critical to the electrification of the world economy. Uh, The first major trend will be light weighting. Everything that moves from point A to point B in transportation has to be made stronger and lighter so that there's less carbon dioxide or global warming gas involved in getting you from point A to point B. So aluminum and all of the alloys that strengthen aluminum, like magnesium and scandium and lithium, uh, are winners. Then those metals that conduct electrical energy are winners, and copper is the best electrical and thermal conductor, save for gold and silver, which are too expensive for most uses in electrification. So copper is an enormous winner, along with aluminum. Then come a suite of specialty metals that are critical for a whole host of uses in catalytic converters as we phase out the internal combustion engine, platinum and palladium and rhodium. And specialty metals that harden steel and create all kinds of industrial magic, like niobium and vanadium. And scandium, as as an additive to aluminum, turns aluminum into something like titanium another very important metal. So let's say we could identify 10 elements in the periodic table whose value is certain to rise against the United States dollar or any other fiat currency. And then we have another series of commodities which over time, and I'm talking about over a considerable period of time, are likely to be less valuable. And that would be you know, hydrocarbon and coal. Now, hydrocarbon will still have value for plastics and petrochemicals and specialty uses. And probably once a year, you'll roll out an old internal combustion engine and get a permit to take it down Fifth Avenue in New York on, say, the 4th of July. But uh, there's going to be a generation of kids that are about to grow up who will have never experienced an internal combustion engine. So the world is going to change, and as a consequence, there's a very safe long-term play in playing those electrification metals. Let's talk now about not just the battery metals, but the battery technology. I hear a lot of investors saying, look, you got to speculate in lithium because, boy, electric vehicles are coming. They need lithium to build those lithium-ion batteries. And I, I think, wait a minute, every few years we get an advancement in a new battery chemistry and something's better than the last one. We went from nickel metal hydride to lithium to lithium ion. Uh, What comes next? And I know you've talked a lot about nickel in the past. Is nickel the common denominator that there's some metallurgical or, or physics reason that the nickel is going to be in the batteries regardless of what the next chemistry is? Or is there a possibility that the next chemistry doesn't involve nickel? Well, first of all, uh, we'll, we'll talk about batteries, but let's not forget the hydrogen economy because these two massive technological changes are not really enemies. They'll, they will travel together in different lanes. But starting with batteries, basically, what we're doing with the transportation batteries is we're, we're on a super intensive, sustained effort to make them more energy dense to make uh, the energy contained in a battery more like gasoline. If we have a gallon of gasoline between us and I light a match, you can see the enormous amount of energy stored in a gallon of gasoline. We'd be, we'd be in a you know, flash of fire. There'd be an explosion. So as these energies become more energy dense, certain metals and technologies are required. We started with nickel, you know, nickel metal hydride, and the current rage is lithium ion batteries. And yes, they are not really made out of lithium. There's lithium in them, but the the predominant constituent in the current generation of batteries is actually nickel and to a lesser degree cobalt and then lithium. And we're going to be moving away from lithium-ion batteries into quasi-solid state 
uh, polymer or gel related batteries that will be safer and even more energy dense. So the holy grail is to make these batteries extremely energy dense and yet relatively safe from the possibility of fire. A lot of people don't know that it's not just wood in your fireplace that burns, but lithium burns and aluminum burns and most metals will burn. So you're, you're trying to make the uh, battery more energy dense and yet make it less likely to catch on fire in the event of an impact or a penetration into the battery system. And so the technology is very, very rapidly evolving. And within five years, we will be beyond lithium ion batteries. The anode side of the battery will probably evolve from its current generation to a silicon anode or a lithium metal anode. And the cathode side of the battery will have more and more nickel for a high energy density. The luxury batteries for a Porsche or for a Mercedes for a high quality car will, will be very nickeliferous. It will have some cobalt, not zero, perhaps less, but a lot of nickel. And it doesn't matter whether you call it solid state or quasi solid state. All of the high end energy dense batteries will require nickel. It will be possible to make a cheaper battery with you know phosphorus and iron battery, but you know it'll be an inferior battery for a cheaper car. If you just want short range and you want to run down to the store to pick up a dozen eggs, it's possible to have a cheaper car with a cheaper battery. But since everybody wants something great, most of the pressure is going to be on nickel metal. Lithium will have to be mined in much greater quantity than it's mined today, but fortunately, lithium is an extremely common salt in the crust of the earth. Lithium metal is found around the world in numerous deposits. Nickel is a much harder fish to catch. And so we're going to see a shortage of nickel long before we really have to worry about the physical supply of lithium. Where are the investment plays there? Is it in mining companies that mine those metals? Is it in battery companies that engineer new battery chemistries? Uh, how does an investor play this advancement of battery technology? The battery companies that are getting into actual alliances with the automakers are going to be big winners on the electrification side. You hear the names of the legendary automobile companies, but they're basically assemblers of components. And the critical component in the electric car is the battery itself. It replaces the internal combustion engine because the electric motor is widely available and extremely reliable. NIDEC from Japan is the world's biggest builder of electric motors. And NIDEC is a great company, privately owned. But the batteries, uh, they're going to be competing technologies. There'll probably be three or four or five industry leaders. And the market will be vast. So for vehicles up to the size of an SUV, better battery technologies will come from a relatively small group of disruptive battery producers. But all of them are going to need nickel. And all of them are going to have to make their anode out of either silicon or solid carbon or graphite or lithium metal. So the technology is converging on those winners that can increase energy density and yet prevent their batteries from bursting into flames, either with software management systems that warn you before a battery is going to fail and hence become unsafe, or internally engineered systems to make sure that the batteries don't get to thermal runaway. Thermal runaway is the term of art uh, about when a battery gets so hot, you've got to worry about it bursting into flames or exploding. That's when it's pretending to act like gasoline. And I can assure you that as we get to energy-dense batteries, that's our single biggest concern is safety. Because anything with that energy density is inherently potentially dangerous. So if you want to you know, have room for your kids in the back seat and a set of golf clubs, you're going to be buying a car with, with great energy density in the batteries. And those batteries are going to be brought to you by a handful of disruptive technology companies. Now, you can either have a basket or a portfolio approach of those companies. QuantumScape was an early mover with a lot of, a lot of market reaction, as you well know. 
it was put into a SPAC and had a spectacular run-up. But there will be others coming to market soon, probably three or four or five of the better ones. The ones that have a relationship with an automaker, uh, where you can see that they're going to be supplying batteries to a major automaker, will probably trade at the highest valuations. Robert, let's move on from the electrification of the economy and the grid to the actual generation of that electrical energy that we need. We talked in the Smarter Markets interviews about the thorium reactor cycle. And specifically, I've followed Kirk Sorensen's videos for years and years now on the liquid fluoride thorium reactor, which just blows my mind is this thing was prototyped and demonstrated and proven like 50 years ago. So we know it works. At the time, it was rejected because, specifically, it does not create weapons-grade plutonium as a a side effect of of its uh, process of generating electricity. And that's what they needed at the time for the Cold War. Now that we don't have a Cold War, it seems so obvious to me that somebody ought to commercialize that what really is a 50-year-old proven technology of the thorium reactor. Frankly, I would commit my life to that if I had the assets to do it, but I don't. Robert, you do. Why doesn't a guy like you organize a venture to create this thorium reactor, build it in a factory so you've got modular ones you could ship anywhere, and say to the world, look, there's a new source of energy which doesn't have nuclear proliferation risk. It, it doesn't result in, in you know, risking any nuclear wars because it doesn't create the metals that are needed to make the nuclear bombs. It cannot possibly melt down. It's a completely different approach to nuclear, and it's a much better approach. Nobody's, well, I guess uh, you said the country of India is doing a lot of research on this. What about commercialization of it and selling it to the rest of the world? It seems to me like it's such an obvious play. I think you'd uh, want to do an interview with uh, Laurent Frescoline, my partner. He's a plasma physicist, and he's spent a lifetime in strategic weapons engineering and uh, deep, deep knowledge of nuclear fuel and thorium cycles. And you're absolutely correct that it is an accident of history that we went on the uranium cycle because of its advantage that it produced plutonium and other materials that were required for atomic weaponry. And the whole regulatory system, the whole governmental system in most countries is geared to using uranium and the recovery of uranium in the nuclear energy industry. And any good plasma physicist will tell you that absolutely you're correct. The thorium cycle could be developed. As I'd mentioned to you earlier, the Indian government is a world leader in the thorium cycle, and it would be a wonderful thing for humanity. But I think there's still, you know, when you ask me as an individual investor, what's stopping anybody from doing this are enormous regulatory burdens and just the inertia of the current industry. You're underestimating the difficulty of getting the American government, which changes frequently, you know, to to actually allow the creation of such an industry and the demise of the current nuclear establishment. That's a really tough road to hoe for one entrepreneur to think about. Clearly, uh, it has to be done at a governmental level. If the Chinese want to develop a thorium cycle, or the Indians want to develop a, a thorium cycle, or the Americans or the Japanese, if they put their mind to it, absolutely, we could do it. And that's why politics you know, would be better to move from such stupid issues as whether to wear a mask or not, and focus on the truly important issues of why don't we just find better ways to generate endless electrical energy for humanity without the deleterious effects of the uranium cycle. It's certainly doable, and basically I violently agree with you, which means I'll beat up anybody that disagrees with us, but there are simpler and better ways to get there from here. I know where you're headed because I've been thinking about this since our Smarter Markets interview. One of the points that you made is there's a gigantic nuclear reactor. It's called the center of the earth, and it's generating intense amounts of heat to the point that there are major granite formations that are heated to several hundred degrees Celsius uh, that are just, I don't know how many thousand feet it is below the, the surface, but not that much farther than current technology has the ability to mine. And you made the point in those 
interviews we did on Smarter Markets that all you need in order to deliver the world a safe, completely clean source of unlimited electric energy is figure out how to drill deeper holes, drill them horizontally the same way that we drill oil wells horizontally today, but at a larger diameter and drill them through very hot rock, uh, several hundred degrees granite. If we could drill radiators, as you put it, into granite submerged, uh, you'll have to tell me how many thousand feet below the surface, you could create geothermal electric plants that could supply the entire world with unlimited, completely clean green energy. And all you have to do is what? It's build a, a better drill bit. What? Tell us again, precisely, what's the technology that's needed in order to enable that outcome? And why couldn't we just take existing lateral drilling oil rig technology? It seems like, it, to me, it's not that far off. What's the shortcoming? The drill bit can't drill the big enough hole or it can't drill the hole through the hot enough rock? What's the problem? We have a, a private American unicorn called iPulse, which has uh, commercialized non-military applications of ultra-high energy pulse electrical power technologies that heretofore were used only for strategic weaponry, electromagnetic pulse weaponry, and other military applications. So setting aside our private company, and to answer your question, we're all very fond of Mother Earth, but we're not taught in grade school that Mother Earth is, in fact, a nuclear reactor, just like the sun. When you're talking about solar energy, that is nuclear, that, you know, that's ultimately nuclear fuel, drives the sun, which creates the energy that comes to us as solar radiation. It's obvious to you when you get in the sun, you can feel that heat from that nuclear reactor. The ancient Egyptians called it Ra, the sun god. But well, you might not know that at the center of the earth, there's sufficient remnant uranium and very, very high natural rock pressures due to the gravity pushing on the center of the earth, that the center of the earth is a natural nuclear reactor. Mother Earth is a nuclear reactor. At the center of the earth, we think the temperature at the core is approximately 11,000 degrees Fahrenheit just about the same temperature as the surface of the sun. And there's enough remnant uranium to, to cause that fission reaction in the core of the Earth to last several billion years. So in terms of the time scale of human evolution, several billion years is a long time from now before the core of our Earth goes cold because it runs out of fuel. So modern you know, understanding of plate tectonics indicates that there's really almost nowhere in the world, if you drill a hole more than 20 kilometers deep, you don't get below the solid, or what you'd call rock or solid floating continents, and you go into the mantle, which is molten. And you see that bubbling up you know, in Haleakala in Hawaii, for example, or any volcano, the, the source of all that heat at the center of the earth that is our mother earth. She is a nuclear reactor. So we can look to the sun god Ra for solar energy, or we can just look beneath our feet to our mother nuclear reactor and tap limitless amounts of geothermal energy. It's the cleanest solution because it, it you know the sun doesn't shine all the time, and the wind doesn't blow all the time, and the tides while regular, are somewhat difficult to harvest. But uh, the geothermal energy below our feet is always there. Now, the areas along the edge of, of the, the continents, you take uh, from Alaska down to Chile on the West Coast, the rim of fire, or the big fractures like in, they run through Indonesia or Japan, you find that when you look at a heat map of the Earth, there are very, very large areas on this planet where the continental crust is very thin, and there are very large rock masses called granites, which are solidified molten rock that are not very deep and very, very, very hot. In the United States, we have hot, dry granites that are 30, 40, 50 miles across, and some of them are not very deep at all. They're 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 feet deep, quite shallow compared to an oil well. And if they're hot enough to make steam to run a generator, 
you can generate a limitless amount of free electrical energy with no global warming effects, and more importantly, with the, with the capability to generate baseline electrical loads. Because unfortunately, because the wind is intermittent and the sun is intermittent, you need baseline power, you know, sort of a, for base demand. And that could be nuclear, could be natural gas as a transition fuel. But something has to provide that electrical energy when the wind is not blowing or the sun is not shining. And geothermal is ideal. Hang on a second, Robert. I just want to understand more specifically with respect to the technology that we already have in the oil industry, which is the ability to drill down and then turn the drill bit and drill sideways and do these long lateral, uh, in the case of oil, it's oil wells. What is the problem with just repurposing those same oil drilling rigs and saying, let's go to where some of this hot granite is, drill down, drill sideways, drill that radiator you've talked about, and create the limitless source of geothermal energy. Is the problem that the oil drilling rig can't drill into that type of rock? Is it because of the heat of it? What's the challenge? Why, why can't we just use the stuff we got? No, there's absolutely no possibility to use the current generation of oil drilling rigs. So forget about it. Forget about it. That won't work. Why not? What's, so, what's missing? Uh, so, so the way we've drilled for the last 200 years is we put an enormous amount of mechanical pressure on a rotating drill bit. Usually you use industrial diamonds at the head of that bit, and it takes an enormous amount of energy to turn that drill steel. And in order to really bend around corners, you need a completely different way to drill. You need a much cheaper way to drill. You need a sort of a robot that can get into hot rock and do the drilling for you, a Pac-Man machine that has to be completely re-engineered and redesigned. So the electronics in that device would have to tolerate temperatures of about 250 degrees centigrade or two and a half times the temperature of boiling water and would have to use a completely different physical principle to drill large diameter holes in hot rock. Uh, we're quite confident that this is achievable with the current state of human technological development within a period of, say, five or a maximum of 10 years. We know how to do it. We're heading in that direction. And we're also seeking and are likely to receive support from one or more governments to achieve that end. Hopefully, the new Department of Energy in the United States, for example, will take an interest in this obvious solution. But we have another government that is taking a great deal of interest. So what this entails is using electromagnetic pulses to spalt rock, to turn rock into a gas, and to drive a series of devices that, to our mind, could drive these tunnels through hot rock. And once you've done that, you just inject water into those tunnels, make steam, and then recycle that steam when it condenses after it generates electrical energy into an endless loop and generate free electrical energy with no, you know, with basically no moving parts required other than the steam generator. So it's the same as a nuclear power plant. It's a nuclear power plant generates steam with a uranium reaction making heat. In this case, we just use the heat from Mother Earth. There's no global warming effects. And we can do it. It's a lot easier than putting a man on the moon or Mars, believe me. Now, that's one of the things that your company, iPulse, is taking on. Robert, why are you doing this? You said it's a unicorn company, so upwards of a billion dollars of market capitalization. Obviously, with your personal background and, and you know accomplishments in your career, it's not like you can't launch an IPO. Why wouldn't you take this company public that's going to invent this Pac-Man machine that can drill these large diameter holes that could potentially create unlimited amounts of energy? We have a lot of other more immediate commercial uses for derivatives of that technology. Uh, we're using that technology for a new generation of geophysical instruments to see water in the crust of the earth or to see copper or gold or electrically conductive metals. That's in the mining division, HPX, which means it stands for high-powered exploration. We're using those technologies in a, a new suite of uh, machinery to find new ways to make things out of metals. So we're involved in manufacturing with major aircraft manufacturers, 
major automobile manufacturers and in luxury goods manufacture. And we're also working to disrupt the existing hydrocarbon industry to get a lot more oil and gas out of an existing oil well. So the, the projects that we look at for generating and finding more water from the crust of the earth or generating energy from the crust of the earth are, are sort of our main dreams. So, so a lot of the tech billionaires, they like the idea of going to Mars. I, I like that. I like that idea too. But I think it's even cooler to figure out a way to get infinite carbon-free electrical energy for humanity right here on this particular planet. And so that's something we're focusing on as a very important and achievable industrial dream at iPulse. Now, we, we really kept it quite private for a long time, but we do have a website now, www.ipulse-group.com, and I'm quite findable at robert.ivano.net. We're working with one of the world's major investor investment banks, and we'll, we are contemplating whether to stay private and raise more capital or be more public about our efforts. But the good news for you, Eric, is we've never spoken about this to anybody, to any broadcaster or news media. Well, Robert, I'm sure that a lot of our listeners are thinking the same thing I am, which is what you say makes perfect sense. And frankly, regardless of whether your company, iPulse, figures out this Pac-Man machine or someone else beats you to it because they've got an even better idea, all it's going to take is for somebody to invent that Pac-Man machine, the thing that goes down a few thousand feet below the surface, drills large diameter tunnels through very hot granite so it's, it's got to be a, a, a temperature a high temperature tolerant machinery which adds some engineering challenge whoever builds that first can create an unlimited source of geothermal energy to provide as much electricity as we need to run the global economy forever that's a really really big deal well we violently agree that means we'll beat up anybody that disagrees with us you know the best ideas the, the most brilliant ideas are the simplest so these are the irrevocable facts. Mother Earth is a nuclear reactor. All the energy you need is right beneath your feet. You've experienced it if you went to Japan and sat in a natural hot spring in a hot tub, you know, a natural hot tub. There's hot springs all over the world. You can see it in Yellowstone, Montana, for example. In Yellowstone, Montana, that hot rock is right below your feet. You're basically standing on it when you go see Old Faithful, for example. But even in the heart of New York City, if you drill a deep enough hole, there's an infinite amount of heat. So the energy we need, it's right underneath our feet, provided by Mother Earth, our friendly mother female nuclear reactor. And, and we, we know that this is doable. And quite frankly, we're fully intent on doing it. Well, as much as I would love to give you a chance to, quote unquote, talk your book and sell your company, iPulse, you don't want to do that because it's private. So what can you tell our investor audience about other ways to play this revolution in geothermal energy? Because somebody, whether it's you at iPulse or someone else, is going to figure this out. And it seems to me like such an obvious solution that geothermal power generation could provide us with all the electricity that we need. And we, if that and the real build out of a completely modernized electric grid, um, give me something that you're not doing in a private company people can't invest in <laughs> to help our investors out. We're living in an era of an explosion of human creativity. There are two or three Hyperloop companies and they say, why is a train sitting on the surface when you can bore a tunnel and rock Perhaps uh, maybe what you want to do is remove some of the air in that tunnel so you have a partial or full vacuum and let the train go screaming over a rail, perhaps magnetically levitated at five or 600 miles an hour. It wouldn't bother you underground and it would use very little energy. And so the Hyperloop concept is just an idea. Definitely we can do it. You need a cheaper way to drive tunnels underground and that's the same problem. The, the Nobel Prize came from dynamite, and the invention of dynamite made it much easier to drive a subway tunnel or, say, the Callahan Tunnel getting from Logan Airport to downtown Boston or the new tunnel we're going to put from New Jersey to New York City. Tunneling is a big deal because you're going into Mother Earth, and if you can figure out a cheaper way to tunnel and you tunnel through hot rock, then we're finished with the energy problem. We don't need hydrocarbon anymore. 
We don't need natural gas anymore. We don't need nuclear power anymore. We don't need solar energy anymore. And we don't need wind power anymore. And so the solution is blatantly obvious and focused human technology and intent will achieve it in our lifetime. I'm certain of that. Robert, I can't thank you enough for a terrific interview. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Looking for exposure to rising silver and gold prices? Abra Silver Resource Corporation, ticker ABRA on TSX Venture Exchange, and ABBRF in the United States, is rapidly emerging as one of the premier silver and gold-focused exploration companies. Abra Silver has an advanced stage project with a large resource base of over 140 million ounces on a silver equivalent basis and has recently announced several very high-grade silver and gold drill results, with more results pending. Abra Silver is very well funded with a strong shareholder base and excellent exploration upside potential. Visit abrasilver.com for more information. That's A B R A Silver. Dot com for more information on this silver and gold exploration stock. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, it was great to have Robert on the show. Just so many great insights as to the way things are going to be evolving in the decades to come. Earlier, you were mentioning that you wanted to elaborate a little bit on this. Uh, what's on your mind? Patrick, to put this in context, I really think that Robert shared a profound insight with us, which is, look, geothermal power has been around for decades, and based on the available technology, it is one of the viable sources of renewable energy, but it's not a game changer. It doesn't solve the whole problem for the whole planet. It's only a small part of the solution based on the technology that we now have. And what Robert pointed out in the Smarter Markets interview and what we started to talk about in today's interview is all you really have to do is figure out how to go only a little bit farther than the technology that already exists in the oil industry. We already know how to drill horizontal oil wells miles through rock. The thing is, it's oil shale. It's, it's not super dense granite. And more importantly, it's rock which is at a temperature that the drill bit can operate in. It's not super hot granite. But if you could just invent that Pac-Man machine, and you know what the machine looks like. You've seen it in all kinds of sci-fi movies. You know, it's pointy at the end and drills through rock and makes a tunnel and uh, leaves rubble behind it. If you can just invent that Pac-Man machine that drills long horizontal tunnels through very hot granite, say 250 to 300 degrees Celsius, you can literally solve the clean energy problem for the entire planet and supply enough clean, green electricity to recharge all of the electric vehicles that the world could ever build. It really is a profound game changer for society, for the future of the planet. It completely solves the decarbonization climate change problem. It is just huge. Now, what we don't have in this conversation is a solution. Robert's company, iPulse, is working on a very innovative way of trying to address this problem. Is Robert going to crack this nut or is somebody else? I don't know. But whoever does is going to change the future of world history. And it completely changes my perspective. I've been assuming for a long time that we had to eventually have a nuclear renaissance, that we would have to accept that nuclear is the best option, get over our emotional hang-ups and the very difficult baggage of the various accidents like Fukushima that the world has been through and recognize that we need nuclear energy. This is the first time I've really seen that there is a viable solution that provides enough energy to supply the entire planet with all the clean green energy it needs without even needing 
to go nuclear. And the question is, can somebody invent that machine that has to drill holes in very hot, very deep rock? You know, Patrick, considering that we sent a man to the moon 50 years ago, it's just not an unthinkable technological challenge that we could figure out how to get better at drilling holes in rock, something that the oil industry has been very good at doing for decades. So I really think this is something that I I want to encourage Macro Voices listeners to really take to heart. Imagine that you've got the answer, which is the way we're going to solve this climate change problem is a new generation of geothermal energy that doesn't exist yet. One where you can just have a deep well in the ground, you pump water down in it, it goes through essentially a radiator that's drilled through very deep, very hot formations of granite. And what comes back up through the other end is not hot water, but highly pressurized steam that's ready to run a gas turbine and actually produce electricity that can fuel the entire global economy. It's all possible if you could go deeper larger diameter holes in hotter rock than we know how to drill holes in today. I've got to believe these are challenges that modern science can take on. It's a question of who's going to be first to solve the problem and what it's going to look like. And I think this is just a really, really fascinating investment trend that we should all pay close attention to in coming years. Anyway, that's enough of my soapbox. Let's move on, Patrick, to this week's postgame chart deck. Listeners, you'll find the download link in your research roundup email. It says, flirting with the 50-day moving averages. And on page two, we have, you guessed it, a chart of the S&P 500 stock index futures. Patrick, what's going on here? Well, I want to just stop and go back to the 50-day moving average uh, in a bigger picture, which is it's the average price of 50 days. And so when a market trends, it breaks away from that 50-day moving average. And it, you can usually identify trends, uh, really beautiful trends. Inevitably, the market always moves in ebb and flow. And every rally that occurs in a market mean reverts and there's some sort of backfilling. And it is quite common for a very typical pause in the market or a correction to just mean revert back to its average price of its, uh, of the, let's say, last 50 days. And that's why a lot of technicians and trend followers tend to anchor on that 50, 100, and 200 day moving averages or 13 week moving average or whichever one that is to your fancy. And, and really what I wanted to, to identify when we're looking at these charts is, is that we had markets that were trending quite strongly over the last kind of five, six months. And almost all of these charts are showing that mean reversion, that correction, and they're all flirting with now having dropped to their 50-day moving averages. And this is such an interesting crossroad in the market because if this was just the market pause and if it was just a little correction, then the question is, is this a buy on dip on all of these things? Or is there something more ominous uh, afoot where these corrections can turn into something a little more bearish? And uh, I just wanted to kind of go through these charts and see where we're at with all of these uh, at these different points. And so the S&P 500 on page two, we uh, have flirted with that 50-day moving average both in January and March, earlier in March, and we're back there again. And uh, each time that we've corrected down to this 50-day moving average, the market has more or less, the buy and dip traders came back each time. And we find ourselves now again testing this zone. It's going to be really interesting to see whether the bulls can hold the line here right around this 3850 level on the S&P. Okay, so 3850, about where we are, just a little below where we are right now as we're recording on Thursday afternoon, is the number to watch on the S&P 500. Let's move on to the other indices. We've got the Russell on page three. Looks like we're already below it. Is that significant? Well, it's significant, actually, with the magnitude of the selling in the last week. And what we've seen, uh, and something we've uh, talked about here on this show numerous times, was during the whole reflation trade and everything that was working, we had everything from the financials to cyclicals to value and small caps all doing incredibly well. And the Russell, actually, during the entire period since November, has been leadership and it's been outperforming. And uh, what we witnessed uh, happen in the last week on the Russell, 
Russell was a, a selling of such magnitude that it wiped out the entire March rally. While the S&P 500 is barely mean reverting that, that rise, the Russell has given it all back. And that immediately um, acts as a warning to me because it's like, has something shifted in that, uh, that let's say, a Russell over NASDAQ chart that we've uh, shared in the past as well? Now, often when you see this type of selling, if we see a failed rally come on the other side of, uh, of a bounce here, that may often indicate that uh, the Russell is going to either underperform or even go through a deeper correction. And I think that uh, we can't ignore what's happening in these small caps. NASDAQ 100 futures is the next chart, and it too is already below the line, below the 50-day moving average. What do you make of that? Well, it's not just that it's below its 50-day moving average, but uh, unlike uh, the, the S&P and the Russell that were in the month of March able to make higher highs, the NASDAQ has not. In fact, the NASDAQ has like, uh, barely beat a 50% retracement of, of the sell-off that it started in February. And almost every attempt to rally has been met with selling. And it just uh, feels very much uh, uh, like almost a gold chart, which is like just rolling over. And, and this is uh, going to be key because the NASDAQ has been the leadership higher. And if we see things like uh, financials and small caps and all these other sectors, that have been doing so well, if they begin correcting and something like the NASDAQ doesn't step up and, and take the baton to be some sort of leadership in this rotation, then you have to ask that question, what part of the market can be the leadership in order to drive another bull run? And the fact that we're seeing cracks in the armor for the Russell and the NASDAQ misbehaving, it really does ask that really important question, what is going to drive the next advance in the market if these supports do hold, right? With that said, Eric, I want to look on page five here on the chart of the financial ETF, the XLF. And uh, what was really interesting is, is that the financials, whether you're talking regional banks, even global banks, all of them, the money center banks, they have truly been one of the hottest sectors throughout this uh, last kind of uh, four, five, six months. And they have been continuously advancing even when other parts of the market were correcting. And it's really interesting in the last week, we finally have seen that correction kick in on these financials. And the financials are slowly approaching that 50-day moving average where back in January acted as a great buy on dip opportunity. And this is uh, also, again, something that I'm watching because if we see that uh, the financials can turn around and be that leadership, well, that would be a, a bonus or a plus for the bulls. But uh, as we approach here, whether or not the financials act as a buy on dip here, I think is one of the little puzzle pieces that is uh, totally worth watching. Patrick, as I look on to page six, I'm having a hard time reconciling what this VIX chart is showing me with what you said earlier, because, you know, boy, when you, you talk about the S&P flirting with its 50-day, the Russell's already below it, the NASDAQ, which led the way up, appears to be leading the way down, it's already ventured substantially below its 50-day, and it's it's now still below it, but, but trying to, to hug it a little bit more. Boy, it seems like things are heating up, volatility is increasing, the you know, situation's getting a little bit scarier here. But then I look at page six, and it shows that we've just passed a new, looks like one year low in stock index volatility. Yeah, this is actually one of the more interesting things I wanted to observe, right? So the 50-day moving average, I'm not a, I don't want to use it as a predictive power on a, a something like the VIX, which is far more range-bound. But it, it, the moving average shows you just sort of what the average price has been. And what I find fascinating is the last two times we uh, had uh, little quick market corrections, the VIX went ripping higher up into the 30 plus, 38 range. And here, we haven't even seen the VIX react in any meaningful way off of the lows. In other words, like that fear premium that tends to be put into options for people that are hedging doesn't seem that this time around we're getting that kind of blast higher. And I'm wondering whether that is uh, something that's warning of too much complacency into this little correction or or whether uh, there just is uh, that much active vol selling that that is allowing this to be suppressed. But uh, watching whether the VIX starts to react on the upside here during this little pullback is uh, 100% on the radar. 
Let's move on to the dollar index, Patrick, because one of the things that a lot of people have said is that the biggest threat to the stock indices would be if a dollar rally started to go out of control, which some people have cited as a major risk factor. It hasn't gone out of control yet, but boy, this dollar rally is starting to look like it's got some legs to it. Yeah, Eric, when we're looking at this dollar index, the, the interesting part to me is, is that because the U.S. dollar still is the world reserve currency, it tends to be still an anchor for the reflation trade. And really, one of the things that we've been watching on the show for the last month is whether or not the dollar was going to put in a bottom. You know, we were talking about it all the way through January and February. And really, what we have seen for the first time in over six, seven months, a sustained period from which the U.S. dollar has been able to maintain above that 50-day moving average. I mean, during the entire U.S. dollar bear market in traditional form, it stayed decisively below that 50-day moving average. And so, so there is a shift of trend. And what we have now is three consecutive days of attempting to break out above 92 and consolidating well above that 50-day. And so really, it's starting to look like that dollar index may very well go here. And it, what will be interesting to see is, is that will that be enough to send the ripples through the intermarkets and, and cause other markets to start getting a little bit nervous. One way or another, there's definitely a, a, some sort of a, a shift happening there. Patrick, let's move on to your Bitcoin chart. Now, I notice finally, it seems like the news flow is starting to say, oh my gosh, there's a real serious risk of Bitcoin being outlawed by governments. Whoever could have seen that one coming? I don't know why that wasn't an obvious risk to everyone before, but it seems like it's suddenly on the radar. Is that what's driving the downside? Well, you know, I don't even know if I want to overread the downside just yet. What I find uh, really interesting with that 50-day moving average there is, is that almost every advance Bitcoin has had, the buy on dip traders were very quick to buy this 50-day moving average. Every time we mean reverted and retraced some sort of an advance, this is the zones where the buy on dip traders came in. And uh, it worked uh, in January. It worked again in late February, early March. And here we are again in late March, and we, ha we are testing this 50-day moving average. And I think it would be a huge tell if uh, the buy and dip traders didn't show up this time. And before I make a big predictive call on this, I think it's worth uh, at this moment just observing over the next uh, a week whether or not we see uh, some sort of new accumulation come off of here. I think that it would be a blow to the uh, Bitcoin bulls if we saw selling south of 50,000 and failed rallies on the other side. And that would really mean that some sort of a distributive cycle has potentially kicked in. It's premature to jump to that conclusion, but boy, are we at an interesting crossroad right now where typically we would have seen those buyers come back in. Let's move on to my own favorite chart, crude oil, on page nine. Boy, we certainly see that 50-day moving average has, uh, if nothing else, generated plenty of volatility in the chart here, hasn't it? Exactly. And again, this is just the way that we describe the 50-day in the first place, which is that during bull trends, the uh, the price decisively moves away from that average price and, and goes in full trend higher, and then often mean reverts back there. And what's interesting here is, is that the 50-day moving average now is where the crude oil is toying with. There are some fib retracements that lie a little bit lower in the mid-50s that could also be where crude oil could correct into. But uh, we have seen in the past the 50-day moving average, uh, at least to offer a reaction. And so was yesterday's reaction all we're going to get, or is there still going to be a quick bounce here into the low 60s? It's going to be really interesting to see. But this really is very consistent with where we are on so many other commodities as well. Because like when we go to page 10 and look at the copper chart, similarly, copper had that huge run in February. And again, we're just uh, mean reverting and correcting right to that 50-day. And in a commodity, commodity bull market, these types of corrections happen, and these are the levels that typically would be bought on dip. And this is why uh, flirting with the 50 day is the title of this whole presentation is because we're literally there at so many of these markets. And it, it's going to be revealed to us over the next few weeks as to whether this was just a great buy on dip opportunity in these markets, or whether um, these corrections are going to be much deeper, more prolonged, because typically, if the 50 day doesn't hold, 
then one of those uh, kind of multi-month, much deeper corrections ensues. I, I, I think it's premature to conclude a bear market or something more ominous like that. But for many of these markets, this is a moment where we're going to find out whether the trend that's been established for the last six months has uh, or is going to be interrupted. Before we close, let's go back to page nine and look at crude oil again. I'd like to talk a little bit more, since you're the technician in the house, about levels that are possible. Let's assume for sake of argument that we do get a breakdown below this 50-day moving average. Okay, we, we had one of those back in October, and it actually set the stage for uh, just an epic rally. So, you know, maybe that's not a bad thing in terms of, uh, you know, shaking the weak hands out of the system and, and preparing the market to maybe stage another big move higher. Let's talk about where the downside targets would be if we do see sustained closes below the 50-day. Where do you think the next levels are? What should we be paying attention to? So, Eric, if the 50-day moving average doesn't hold, then looking for a 50% retracement of the entire oil rally off of that that $36 low that subsequently rose up to the that $67 high, a 50% retracement would be roughly around $52 where that January consolidation occurred. And so I think that that would be a very realistic first target for a quick correction down where one would... Uh, be able to potentially look for uh, the next buy on dip opportunity. But first, I think uh, before uh, already assuming that that's a given, I want to see whether this 50 day holds here. But if it doesn't, then that would be definitely where uh, I would be looking for the next little correction to go. Well, I think we're in strong agreement then, because what I'm looking for here is almost the same number you are, Patrick. You, you've got the 50-day at 58 spot 24, and that's one number. I think another interesting number is the 13-week moving average, because that would be the signal if we close below it on a weekly basis that tells you not only the daily trend has changed, but also the weekly trend has changed. So if we see a close below 57 spot 41, the 13-week moving average and by that I mean a weekly close not just a daily close that says to me probably we're headed I think to exactly where you said somewhere around that January the top of the January consolidation range around 52 53 dollars if there was some particularly bearish news I could see maybe a very brief test of 50 or just below 50 but I don't think we're going to spend much time below 52 or 53 and I think 53 is probably about where the buying zone starts if this level doesn't hold yeah. And well, the really interesting part about this moment as well is, is that no matter where it goes, uh, whether it stops here or whether it goes down toward that $52 range, uh, I do believe that these are going to be great buying opportunities. And that's one of the things that we're looking at doing with, you know, we locked in the advance in a lot of the energy stocks and other things, uh, big picture trading with collars. And so we have a lot of our profits already locked in. And so really the question is, when is the next great buy on dip? opportunity for us to, to be able to reposition for another leg higher. And so it's certainly something on my mind. And needless to say, the best way for our listeners to tune in to what's on your mind, not just every week on Thursday, but every single day, is by signing up for a free 14-day trial of Big Picture Trading. Information is on page 11. We're going to leave it there for this week's podcast. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by Abra Silver Resource Corporation, a premier emerging silver and gold exploration company. Ticker ABRA on TSX Venture and ABBRF in the United States. Patrick, what's in this week's Research Roundup? Well, this week, you're going to find a transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book we just discussed in the post game. There's also a link to an article from Charlie McElligot about stocks are fragile as quarter end rebalancing overwhelms the weaponized gamma. You'll also find a link to a Jesse Felder article, Gold Goes Out of Style. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners, and we're always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, 
Follow our main Twitter account, at Macro Voices, for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter, at Eric S. Townsend, that's Eric spelled with a K, and myself, at Patrick Serezna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit MacroVoices.com. <laughs>